So let me uh, uh, wish a good morning and hopefully everyone can hear. Uh, we have uh, myself this morning and my colleague Jeff Vanderweilen, uh, and we'd like to welcome you to uh, this webinar morning, on the Purpose Revolution. Jeff, you want to just uh, say good morning? Yes, good morning, everybody. Glad to be here and uh, looking forward to spending this next hour together. So a couple of uh, just uh, quick <clears throat> ground rules. Uh, you're all on mute at the moment, uh, but your chat function uh, is working on your screen there on the right side uh, and in those blue uh, columns. And at any time you can send a question. Uh, we have Ainsley uh, from our team uh, who's administrating today and at uh, any moment she uh, can uh, you know take your questions we have a period later where we're going to be uh, talking about questions so uh, for now uh, we'll get started and uh, you know more people will be joining us but but let's get started so we want to honor you for uh, being on time today so the theme of our webinar today, uh, the Purpose Revolution, winning and engaging a purpose-driven uh, talent. And uh, for those of you who have been uh, following uh, my or our work for a long time, we're very excited. I'm holding in my hands uh, my new book, the Purpose, our new book, The Purpose Revolution. Uh, and uh, everything we're going to be talking about today comes from that material. Uh, the book's going to be released in, in just a few weeks now. So let's get started, uh, and uh, I'd like to begin um, by uh, really asking the question, what is purpose? And we have a very simple definition of purpose. Uh, for the individual, for us as individuals, uh, it's the reason for working that's greater than money or status. So obviously we work for money, we work because we learn, we work because it makes us feel good about uh, ourselves and maybe it grows our career. Uh, and one way to think about purpose is, is purposes that uh, uh, meaning or sense of, of uh, living our values that we have at the end of the day that's bigger than money, bigger than status. It's kind of like the, uh, the, the reason that we work that's about our uh, being our truest self. And for the organization, a purpose is an aspirational reason for being that's about making life better now and in the future for all stakeholders, especially customers, society and planet. So one way to think about that is that uh, just like for uh, the individual, it's the part of, of, of work that's more than money and status. For an organization, it's our reason for being that is bigger than than making a profit. It's kind of the contribution that we want to uh, make to the world. And what we want to really talk about today is the role that purpose plays in engaging and retaining employees and what uh, we as leaders can do to truly um, uh, engage uh, people uh, in, in this, what we call the age of social good. So to make this kind of purpose idea real, I want to take you away from the world of business uh, to an experience I had last summer in Sicily. I'm Sicilian uh, and, uh, you know, uh, made a trip there this summer. And one of the things that I did was to uh, hike uh, Mount Etna. And uh, when I came to the bottom of the hiking trail, there were a bunch of uh, uh, people standing there with their animals to get their picture taken, including this gentleman who was standing there with his goat. And I have to admit, I thought, boy, it doesn't get much more red ocean than this, you know, in terms of business, you know, standing there with your animal, hoping to get your picture taken while there's lots of other people standing around with their animal, hoping to get their picture taken and that you might give them money. But this particular gentleman stood out, uh, he stood out because he had a long line of people waiting to have their picture taken with him, even though others were, you know, had hardly any customers. So, of course, I was intrigued. And so I started watching him for a while. And of course, uh, he was all the things you would expect. He was friendly and affable and gregarious. But it didn't take me long to figure out that the real reason that he had a crowd around him compared with others was you could tell that that he wasn't just there 
to make money off people having their picture taken. When I waited and finally had my chance to have my picture taken with him, and by the way, as many of you know, I'm, I'm five foot seven, and obviously I am Sicilian, which I now realize standing next to this guy. But the interesting thing was that um, when I finished having my picture taken with him, I was walking away after I'd already put my money in that basket there when he said, oh, no, wait, you've forgotten the most important thing. And he reached out, and I don't know if you can see it in the picture, but at the bottom there, he had these lava rocks, volcanic rocks, where he had pasted on uh, tiny ladybug eyes. And you can kind of see them in the picture there. And so he handed one to me and said, you've forgotten the most important thing. Uh, I'm giving you this rock so that you will remember that you are a blessing and that you have a chance to be a blessing to other people all of your life. Thank you for visiting. Please be a blessing. And that simple story, I think, really illustrates uh, something that, that we talk about in the book, The Purpose Revolution, which is that people who have a sense of purpose and businesses that have a sense of purpose simply outperform uh, those that don't. That when people, whether they're customers or employees, can see that it's not just about the money. There's something more going on. Something profound happens. And the interesting thing is this simple experience I had in Sicily is mirrored by some absolutely fascinating research by a woman named Amy Wierzynski at Yale University that's now been replicated by many people all over the world. And the research shows that most every person sees their job in one of three ways, either as a job, meaning I'm just doing this for money, if I, you know, if I win the lottery tomorrow, I'm out of here. Uh, second, some people see the, the role they're in as a career. Uh, I'm doing this to kind of, uh, you know, as a stepping stone to something else I want to do in my life. Or some people see their job as a calling from the Latin word vocatio, uh, meaning that they see a deep connection between this job and their values. And they really feel they make a difference in the job that they're in. And the really interesting thing about this research is it shows that the job you have is actually not a very good predictor of how you see your job. So there are uh, surgeons who see their job as just a job and there are um, custodians who see their job as a calling. But where it really gets interesting is it turns out that people who see their job as a calling, like that gentleman did on the, the side of the mountain in Sicily, perform better on almost every metric we care about as leaders. They're more committed, they're more engaged, they're more productive, they provide better service, and they even call in sick less. So obviously, if we can engender a sense of purpose for people, it can make a real difference in our, in our business. And for those of us who run a business or are leaders, uh, you might be interested to know that it turns out that if someone gets a bump in their sense of purpose at work, a bump in their sense of meaning and contribution, it has almost as big an impact on their commitment to their job as a bump in pay. And it doesn't take a, a genius to figure out that you can't uh, raise someone's pay consistently, but maybe we can increase that sense of purpose that people have on a consistent basis. Now, some of you are saying, well, that's great. Uh, you know, I buy it. People who have a sense of purpose probably perform better than others and, and, uh, and maybe uh, are genuinely happier. But what is the purpose revolution? And so while it's probably always been true that people who have a sense of purpose perform better than others and that we all want a sense of purpose in our work, the purpose revolution really represents a... Uh, a, an explosion of expectations all over the world where employees are saying, I want more from my work than status and a paycheck. Now, in our book, we tell the story of this gentleman who you see on the screen named John Replogle. Uh, John was the president of Guinness North America. You know, as he told us, he had life on a string. He was living in suburban Connecticut, had a great job, a great career ladder, making a lot of money. But one of his mentors was uh, challenging him to write a, a personal mission statement. And John said, I wasn't getting any traction on this personal mission statement until 
Uh, one day I was late for work and and strapped my young two young children in the car seats in the in the back seat of my car. And I was thinking about that personal uh, purpose statement when I caught both of their eyes uh, in the rearview mirror in their car seats. And he said, in that moment, he said, I realized that everything I had done in my career so far was for myself. Nothing I had done was going to uh, make a difference uh, in terms of the world that my kids were going to live in or their kids would live in. He said, and I began to cry because I realized it wasn't enough. And for us, that story is the heart of the Purpose Revolution. All over the world, across all demographics, age, uh, country, uh, culture, uh, employees are saying, I want everything I've always wanted in a job. I want a, a great paycheck, a great career ladder. I want to be recognized. I want to be rewarded. But now I want something else. It's not enough just to have those things. I want to be in a job where I get a sense of purpose and where I believe in the company that I'm working for. And so in our book, we make, I think, a very compelling case that uh, that this revolution is happening all over the world and is going to have a huge impact on uh, businesses. Uh, so, Jeff, talk to us a little bit about how purpose is, in fact, driving the talent game all across the world. Yeah, sure. And uh so what we found is, you know, right now, you know, there's a real war, we know, for top talent and not everyone's going to be on top and is going to you know, be able to take advantage of, uh, of getting the best and the brightest. In, in 2017, Deloitte uh, did a great report, uh, their Global Human Capital Trends Report, and it showed that, you know, across the world right now for large companies, there's widespread talent and skill shortages and that getting best talent's one of the top concerns of most business leaders. So the question is, in this time of talent grab, you know, how do you stand out uh, uh, and what makes your organization a magnet uh, for the best and the brightest? And what we found really is it's having an authentic purpose that people can really uh, be, you know, tie their own or connect their own values to. Uh, more than 50 percent of millennials, we know, would actually take a cut in pay to find work that matches their values. So millennials are out actually looking for organizations where their values can match those of the organization. 90% uh, of the employees want to use their skills for good. Uh, and this includes boomers. It's not just millennials. In fact, boomers kind of lead the way in this category. Uh, you know, being a boomer myself, I want to finish strong, right? And, you know, be doing work that, you know, isn't just for a paycheck or for status, but that actually contributes to something bigger than myself. Uh, and that's the trend among boomers. Uh, and it's a global trend. Uh, we found that the expectation uh, that work will serve a higher purpose uh, is greatest in workers in the emerging uh, global middle class in Asia and India. Uh, and then also 37% of the global workforce now uh, is purpose focused. Uh, and yes, there is a way to measure purpose uh, and it's being done and, you know, versus being driven by money or status. Uh, so again, it's not that fair pay is out. Uh, but a key advantage for winning the war on talent for attracting the best and brightest today is really offering work that makes a difference, work that connects employees' values uh, and a deeper sense of meaning to what your company does. So we find that purpose is really driving talent to companies today, to companies with a clear and authentic purpose, right, to companies who are taking an active role in making society a better place who choose to be active agents of good in the world and who aren't just focusing on, on the profit alone. Uh, seventh generation is a great example. They're virtually uh, stealing talent from other people in their industry. Uh, one of their top scientists, for example, the guy who invented fantastic formula 409 at Clorox, joined the seventh generation team because of the impact he felt he could make there. He really felt that his personal values connected to the values of seventh generation as a company. Um, same with their head of R&D. Uh, he had a great career at Procter & Gamble, but wanted to do something more and more meaningful in his career. So he chose to work uh, at seventh generation. Uh, when we wrote the book, we did some interviews and we talked to Kirsten Robinson. She's the executive director of HR uh, for Americas at Ford Motor Company. Uh, and she had the opportunity to do a stint 
uh, at human resources for Ford in China. Uh, and part of her duties was that she would help lead the new employee orientation. So as part of the program, she would always ask the question to new employees. What are the top three reasons you decided to work at Ford? And it turned out that every time, basically, uh, the majority of the people would raise their hand and say, because they want to be part of Ford's company's vision to create a better world. It was always in one of the top three reasons that people wanted to work for Ford Motor Company. Yeah, th thank um, you. Thank you, Jeff. That's, yeah, uh, that's, that's great. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the things the folks at 3M tell us is that when they go to university campuses, the best engineering students and science students actually will come up to them and say, you know, we think we want to work for you. Uh, we just want to know if it's real. So in some ways, 90 percent of their recruiting has already been done. But but even though employees want purpose, uh, uh, there's a there is a problem and it's called the purpose gap. Jeff, just say a word about the purpose gap because it's so important. Yeah, I mean, we know that uh, they want, but 70 percent of the of the of the employees say that really in reality, their experience is a company they work for is not, in fact, purpose driven, but is more focused from their experience on profit and growth really than in, in people and society or the planet. Uh, and the same at, at the CEO level, there's several uh, good reports out there. Ernst and Young put out a good report where, you know, one third, you know, of the CEOs, while they know that, that purpose really drives performance and a lot of other engagement metrics about only one third say they're activating purpose uh, in their company, you know? Um, so it makes you wonder, does this mean we're saying 70% of the companies have no purpose or aren't acting as agents of social good in society. No, uh, we really believe that most companies do have an inherent purpose. Uh, but, you know, really for the past 50 years, what's been the measure of health and, and vitality in organizations? It's really been, you know, financial growth metrics, shareholder value. Uh, and we feel that leaders really haven't been trained or given opportunities to learn about how to lead with purpose. So for us, the purpose gap is really not a threat, but we see it as an opportunity, an opportunity for companies to really amplify their purpose and align with their true values uh, and differentiate themselves from the competition. Uh, and in, in this way, you're going to attract the best talent, uh, promote engagement, uh, as well as create more longstanding value in the long run. Right. So one of the really fascinating things is that while employees want purpose, 70 to 75 percent say my company is not purpose focused. And while CEOs, 83 percent of them say, look, I think purpose would drive performance. Only about a third say they're doing well. So let's dig in then. How do you win in the, in the purpose revolution? Now, before we do that, I just want to make you aware of something we'll remind you of later. Uh, and that is uh, for those of you who are on the webinar today, we have we do have a special offer for you if you're interested in the book, which I think you're really going to love. And that is that if you pre-order the book now, uh, you're going to get two things no one else is going to get. Uh, and the, the, the link is going to be there uh, for you to click whenever you want to. Uh, and a special electronic edition of the book Stepping Up. Some of you may have read it already. Many of you may have not. Uh, my uh, last book before the Purpose Revolution. And finally, access to our Leading on Purpose video, a 12-minute video that really helps leaders think about how to be uh, lead from purpose, something you can actually share with other leaders and use in your company, which normally we sell as part of a several thousand dollar video series. So again, at PurposeRevolution.com, we'd love you to pre-order the book. It really helps us and we know you're going to love the book. So let's dig in. We're going to talk about five keys today to winning and engaging purpose-focused talent. So let's get started. The first thing is to have a purpose. Uh, both a personal and a corporate one, and to keep it visible. Uh, and uh, really, it begins uh, with the organization. Is there, uh, whether you're a small or large organization, do we have a well-articulated purpose that is magnetic, magnetic, authentic, and that people understand and are excited about? And as importantly, is it regularly visible in the organization? And, uh, and by the way, uh, this is also true for us as an individual leader. So one of the things we talk a lot about in the book is the importance of us as individual leaders to connect to our own personal purpose, to 
become aware of it and to regularly communicate it to our teams. And we have lots of exercises in the book that really walk you through how to either define your corporate or team purpose or your individual purpose. But let's look at some great examples. Uh, uh, this one, to inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, and one neighborhood at a time. That's Starbucks uh, uh, purpose. Uh, to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world. Uh, that's Nike. And by the way, the subtext of that is the Nike founder said, and if you have a body, you're an athlete. So it's not just about Olympic athletes like what's going on in uh, uh, Korea right now. Uh, their, their purpose to bring uh, inspiration and innovation to refresh the world, to create moments of happiness and optimism and create value and make a difference. That is the uh, current purpose of Coca-Cola saying, look, we're not just about you know, refreshing the world with drinks, we want to refresh a sense of optimism uh, and, and make a difference in all the realms. And one of the, the, the real questions in an organization is, if you were to sit in on meetings in your organization, look at communication that comes out in the organization, how much of the communication is about profit and task and how much is it about purpose or the real difference that we're making in the lives of our clients or community. And from our experience in most organizations, and I think you'll agree with us, about 80 to 90 percent of the communication is about task or numbers, not about purpose and making a difference. Uh, and as leaders, our first task is to make sure that we have a much uh, stronger balance and focus on messages around purpose. Uh, one of the CEOs of a division that we coached in the aerospace industry, one of the simple things we did was to have her uh, make sure that every time she had a profit message, she also communicated a message about the real difference their products and services were making for the peacekeepers all over the world. And not only did engagement go up and her personal brand go up, in the six months after she started doing that, but it really began to um, uh, create a whole different dynamic in the organization as she and other leaders began to share their personal purpose and connection to the real difference this company was making. So it begins with a clear purpose. And by the way, if you're not, not the CEO of the organization, create a purpose for yourself, create a purpose for your team. You don't have to wait for the whole organization. Now, the second key uh, Jeff's going to talk about here, and uh, so Jeff, uh, take it away. The second key, uh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, really, you know, the second key is helping people think of their job purpose rather than just their job function. Uh, you know, when you think about it, you know, when you ask people, what do they do? They typically describe the tasks and activities uh, and the deliverables that they have around their job. Uh, but job purpose is different. It's really, you know, it's not what you do. Uh, but the difference you make by doing your job, you know, what's the wider value uh, or the impact that your job has on customers, on organizations, other business partners, on society or on the planet. So, you know, it's really connecting your job to something bigger than yourself and that you're really contributing to something more meaningful than just the day to day tasks that you're doing. Disney's a great example. You know, at Disney, the job of every person in the park is to spread happiness. So if you're sweeping the ground, serving food, uh, running a ride, building a set or walking around as Mickey Mouse, right? Your job is to spread happiness. Um, I had the opportunity to do a workshop for Disney once and we were behind the scenes. They gave us a behind the scenes tour of the Orlando Park. And I was really amazed at how much, how, you know, how everybody, they're almost high on Disney, right? People really believed in the brand. They really believed that at the end of the day, all of our work together and what I do really makes a difference to the families and the children who come to visit the park. Um, so the question becomes, you know, how do we do this? You know, and for us, you know, leaders can drive job purpose and how we frame and talk about it at work. So I think we have a choice. We can talk about deliverables. We can talk about tasks and activities, or we can sort of focus on, you know, what's the higher value or purpose of a job. Uh, uh, so for us, it's take time to talk about job purpose and give employees an opportunity to flush it out. A good example of this is Molly Maid, uh, one of the biggest uh, 
uh, uh, cleaning services in uh, in Canada. So one franchise we you know we worked with uh, brought their housekeepers together uh, to discuss and divine job purpose. And here's some things they came up with. They said we give the gift of time, right? The most important thing anybody has, and we give it back to them, is time. Time to go to see their kids' soccer games, time to shop, time to have a night out, time to be active in your community. So again, they're not thinking of their job in terms of you know sweeping and dusting and vacuuming, but it's really that we give people the gift of time. Uh, for elderly people or people living alone, they said we alleviate loneliness. Yeah, we're there. We provide company. Our presence makes a difference. It provides conversation, a sense of continuity and belonging just by having our presence in the home. Uh, one manager yeah. talked to us about during the job interview. Uh, you know, she asked specifically, you know, do these excite you? You know, does alleviating loneliness or giving back the gift of time, uh, does, that, does that connect to you? Uh, is this what you want to do? Um, or she brings in family members, right, to share the difference that the housekeeper's presence and their work makes in the lives of the people that they service. So, yeah, yeah. And, and I think one of the interesting things that this particular franchisee, uh, she is a young franchisee who is Molly made is a global company and she's one of the fastest growing uh, franchises in the world. Uh, and uh, she attributes a great deal of that to driving this job purpose instead of job function. Now, now, this third key is to really create line of sight to purpose. Um, and, and really what that's about is can people consistently see the difference that they're making? So it's great you've got a great articulation of your purpose. It's great that we talk about the purpose of jobs rather than just the function of jobs as leaders. But then the question is, how do we make real for people day in and day out that they can really see that they're making a difference. So let, let, let me give you two uh, very concrete examples. Let's go back to that Molly Maid franchisee who, when she interviews people to be maids in her franchise, tells them you're giving the gift of time, uh, that you know, that the, the, you alleviate a chance to alleviate loneliness. But how do you help people see that day in and day out? Well, one of the things she regularly does is to bring in uh, busy moms, for example, busy single moms who say, you know, to come into their staff meetings and say, let me tell you what it's like in my crazy life <laughs> to come home and have a clean home at the end of the day. You know, this oasis in the midst of the craziness and to know that I can trust you with the keys to my uh, to my uh, palace. Uh, they often bring in family members of their elderly uh, customers to come in and say, let me tell you the difference you have made by befriending uh, my mother, my father, how you've really helped alleviate their loneliness. So she's constantly creating that line of sight. Uh, I think of a large software company we were working with that uh, had, make software for the federal government, folks like the IRS ooh, uh, and the Department of Defense. And one of the things they regularly do is bring in team members from those federal organizations to come in and say, let me tell you how we're serving the citizens in a better way and how my life is better because of your software. Or take Royal Bank, a client of ours, where we help them to the largest bank in Canada and we help them to implement a simple idea which was that in every branch meeting in each of their branches, they would begin the meeting with creating space for people to tell a story about how they had made a difference for a client or a customer since the last time they were together. And what's really fascinating is that all of this is all they did was create a space to talk about the difference that we're making. And in those branches that did it religiously, because, of course, in like in most large organizations, some people did it and some didn't. But in those who did it, they had on average an increase of 20 percent in employee engagement and a 17 percent increase in sales simply by focusing every day in their meetings of that line of sight to the difference that we really were making for customers. So as a leader, you ought to be asking how are we constantly making it obvious that we are making a difference to our clients and customers? Now, the fourth thing 
is to make sure that we make purpose an ongoing conversation in the organization. In other words, it's not just something that that people are sitting around watching your company or team do good, but they really feel engaged and a part of it. And one of the first things that we can do as leaders is actually to begin to ask people what their personal purpose is. Uh, one of the things that we uh, teach our clients to do is to get every person to identify the purpose of their job for themselves. And of course, the leader can begin by role modeling that. In fact, here's a wonderful story. We were working with a law firm uh, and they were going through this process. And uh, when it came time for the main receptionist at the law firm to talk about her job purpose, the head of the law firm, you know, chimed in and he said, you know, Lisa, uh, your purpose is you're the first impressionist for this law firm. You know, when people come into this law firm, you know, you you are the have the chance to make the first impression of what we're all about. And Lisa said to him, well, yeah, you're right. I am the first impressionist. And that, that means something to me. But that's not my purpose. She said, my purpose is I'm a very positive and optimistic person. And a lot of people in the world are not positive and optimistic, especially when they're coming to a law firm. She said, so my purpose is that every person who interacts with me during the day, inside or outside the firm, whether they're with me for 30 seconds or five minutes, I want them to get a burst of happiness and optimism. And so that when they leave me, they feel a little better about themselves and the world than they did before. And we watched as, as that person blossomed, having for the first time been able to name their personal purpose in their work. And for the person who supervised her, he said it totally changed his relationship with her because now when he would pass her in the morning and see her being really friendly to a client or someone inside the company, he would catch her later that day and said, wow, Lisa, you were really living your purpose uh, this morning. Way to go. So the question really is, how do we engage people in that conversation? Let us give you a couple of more simple ways that, that we can do that. At Unilever, one of the most uh, purpose-driven companies in the world, they're asking every leader all over the world to identify their personal purpose and to share it with their team. And think about how impactful it would be in your organization if every leader identified their personal purpose. At Ford, one of the companies that we feature prominently in the book, uh, their sort of emerging purpose is around a better world. We want to create a better world with more electric cars where, you know, mobility uh, is, is adding value to society, not taking away from it. And one of the things they did at Ford was to simply send out a survey to all of their associates and to ask them this question, how are you um, making a better world in your job at Ford right now? And the interesting thing is that just the act of asking people to identify that, and by the way, almost every associate had an idea. Here's how I'm creating a better world in my role. So one way to think about this, um, and we talk about this in the book in a chapter called Hands on Purpose, is that um, purpose is a, is a participant sport, not a spectator sport. So don't think about defining purpose for people. Think about coaching people. What is your purpose? Think about asking people to identify how they're getting to live the purpose in their job. Think about sharing your personal purpose and really engaging people in that uh, conversation in uh, a, a different way. So as leaders, we have to get a lot better at this and, and, and to really be willing to have those kinds of conversations. And in, in our experience, we'll be really surprised how engaged people uh, can get. Now, the fifth key uh, is really to build purpose into all your recruiting and orientation. So go ahead, Jeff, let's say a few words about that. Yeah, and we have some, you know, there's some real key, you know, uh, real simple ways you can start to do that. You know, you can hardwire. First of all, what we recommend is to hardwire purpose into your HR recruiting and orientation uh, and ways to do that are like, for example, to showcase your purpose up front. And the interview process is one of the one of the best ways to do that. And one of the most effective ways to demonstrate that purpose is front and center. Uh, you know, don't just talk about your job duties and requirements like we talked about earlier. Describe your company's story, its ethos, how purpose ties to your team members, values and goals. Uh, 
you know, have people come in uh, uh, to make their mission real, if you will, bring in some current employees uh, into the interview process, uh, have them in there in real time and talk not just about the job they do, but about the difference they make through their job, through the volunteer activities they might be involved with. So kind of flush out, you know, things around your mission and around your purpose, but do it with real employees and real people who can tell the story. Um, you know, during the interview, you know, ask people, you know, what, you know, what's their life purpose? What is, in what ways do they want to contribute? What made your last job meaningful? Uh, when I worked, I worked for Ernst & Young. I remember that was one of the first questions that my hiring manager, Theo, Theodosio, asked me. You know, he said, you know, how are you going to make a difference for the firm? How do you want to make a difference in society through the work you do? And I was sort of taken aback, and this was some years ago. But, you know, it really made me think. And it, it also sent the message, right, that, you know, this company cares about something beyond just the money and beyond just the profit. Uh, and don't be afraid to share your personal purpose and how that's realized in the organization. Um, uh, you know, change job descriptions to focus on purpose. Uh, a good example of that is the well, the West Elm, the furniture company, West Elm. Where they, they actually uh, step back and they redefine their job descriptions away from job purpose uh, and and redefine them in terms of job function. Uh, and you really be surprised at the results, actually. They received 40% fewer applications. So you're saying, well, that's great advice, right? You know, do this and 40% fewer people are going to want to work for your company. Uh, but there's a punchline, and that is they had a 30% increase of the number of people they could actually consider for hiring. So if you think about it, really, it shows that, uh, you know, people who perform better in every metric for their hiring were sort of weeded out and, and came to the surface. So purpose actually worked as a mechanism, if you will, to screen and uh, and make the best fit. So amplifying purpose really creates a more efficient and, and effective uh, uh, recruiting process. Yeah, yeah, I love that story, Jeff. Uh, and again, just get your head around that. They just redefined their job descriptions for recruiting, focusing on purpose instead of function. You know, here's the real difference you can make in this job. And I think it's quite uh, compelling that that fewer people applied and ask yourself as a leader or as a company, if purpose focused people, the guy like the, 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 the guy in Sicily on the side of the mountain perform better on every metric than people who are not focused on purpose. Do you really want employees who are just focused on the job or just focused on their career? Probably not. Uh, and so what West Elm wound up doing was the purpose focused employees were attracted to those job descriptions and the ones who are less purpose focused, who again, probably will provide less good service, might not stay as long, uh, didn't apply, but 30% increase in the number of qualified candidates. So uh, as Jeff said, really begin to think about how you're recruiting and really in your recruiting, uh, tell the story of, of your company. So if you think about closing the gap around purpose, it really comes down to uh, some very simple things. First, do we have a clear, authentic purpose that fits? And again, whether you're a, a company or an individual leader, that could be a team purpose, it could be the purpose of the company, it could be your own personal purpose that is regularly communicated. So again, think about the meetings in your team or your organization. How much of our time is devoted to um, purpose? How much devoted to task? And as leaders, we have to be really careful the subtle messages we might send around purpose. A, a great example is um, uh, recently someone was telling me they were in the C-suite meeting and the vice president of customer service was telling a wonderful story of a difference they made for one of their clients and how some team members had really gone out of their way to make a huge difference for the client. And uh, in the middle of the story, the CEO said, well, uh, Hal, hey, thank you. Thanks a lot. But can you speed it up a little bit? We got to get to the finance report. Now, I'm sure that leader did not intend to send the message that purpose isn't important, but that's the message that he sent. So as leaders, every question we ask, everything we focus on sends a message. I think about Inga Thulin, the CEO of 3M, who we interviewed for the book. Uh, who said that wherever he goes anywhere in the world, the first question he asks the site or the division that he's visiting is, 
uh, tell me what you're doing around sustainability. Because is that I want them to know the first thing I'm interested in is sustainability. The third thing is uh, make sure you live your purpose boldly in what we call moments of truth or purpose congruence moments. Moments when uh, people decide whether your purpose is for real or not. Uh, Whole Foods, one of the companies we feature in the book, uh, Walter Robb, the uh, co-CEO, talked about when they decided to no longer sell unsustainable seafood, even their, even though their customers were buying it and they made a lot of money off of it. And he talked about the tremendous um, uh, benefit they got from employees when employees said, wow, you guys are really serious about your purpose because in this moment when you could have gone one way or the other, you chose to go a certain way. And then finally, led by leaders with purpose who know how to do the things we talked about today drive a purpose down to individual jobs, talk about job purpose, not job function, create line of sight, and engage employees in conversations about their values. And finally, get people hands-on on defining and talking about how we can live the purpose. Uh, and one of the things that's really interesting in that global survey of CEOs is they said the vast majority of people um, are not uh, uh, doing very well at, at, at learning how to lead purpose. Now, the last thing we want to talk about are purpose metrics. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes on this because we want to really open it up for questions. And then we got some closing uh, good ideas to share with you. But one of the, the things to ask yourself is, are you even measuring purpose in your company? So here's some examples. At 3M, every person has sustainability on their performance appraisal. Are you measuring the impact of purpose activities on important outcomes? So, for example, at IBM and at TELUS, uh, the Canadian telecommunications company, they regularly measure uh, whether the people who are involved in volunteering or volunteer activities are more engaged and more likely to stay. And by measuring that, they really build the case for purpose. And as you might not be surprised, in both cases, they found the employees were engaged in doing good and volunteering regularly are more likely to stay and are more engaged. Uh, do you measure pride and desire to recommend? Do you measure whether people feel your company is ethical and that we treat our customers and clients as if we care about their well-being? I think about Manulife, another company we feature in the book that has on their regular employee survey this question, uh, if I saw something unethical in this company, would I feel that I could speak up without fear? And the CEO, Don, former CEO Don Galoin said to us, this is so important that we measure whether people feel we've created a culture of, of, of ethics, a culture where people can speak up. And finally, dare to measure people's authentic connection to your purpose. In other words, ask people on your surveys and in focus groups, uh, do you believe our purpose is real? Do you feel day to day you're getting to make a difference uh, do you really feel connected to this uh, purpose? So, so anyway, this is so. So we're kind of at the time now where we'd love to open it up a bit for some questions, and then we've got some great uh, tidbits to share with you at the end. So don't go away on us. So Ainsley, send us over a question uh, or two, and and we'll uh, entertain them. And if you haven't had a chance to send in a question, just uh, raise your hand and and send one in uh, right now. We're looking forward to. Uh, to uh, uh, handling your, your questions. We know we've covered a, a lot of uh, territory. So just waiting for the first question to come over now. Okay, don't see any questions yet. I'm not sure whether you don't have any or we haven't had one uh, come over yet, but uh, we certainly have more information we can share. Uh, Ainsley, any questions to send over to us? John, I see a few here. We could start. Oh, Someone yeah, asked, yeah, I missed them. Okay, go ahead. What's the question? Yeah. Uh, why aren't people doing well at leading or inspiring purpose? It would be one, one question. And, um, uh, you know, I think we, you know, we started to answer that a little bit. I think actually that's a great question. I think one, you know, one of the reasons is, is I think the way uh, that we've been taught to lead as leaders, that, that the focus is really on, on the metrics uh, and it's on growth and it's on profitability and it's on operational outcomes. You know, if you think about any scorecard that we have in most organizations or any project deliverables, it's usually around those operational or growth sorts of factors. Um, 
So I think so. I think that's one of the big reasons is just the basic framework in American business, for sure, has been around uh, you know companies existing for profit, and that's been our, our pretty much our single measure of health. Uh, yeah, you know, actually, in the book, we have a whole section on why companies fail at purpose, and and uh, one of them is that often purpose is sort of sort of more a marketing function. It's something we're really focused on. Uh, driving purpose with our customers and the public, when in fact, if you look at the most purpose-driven companies, uh, they tend to spend a lot of energy uh, driving the purpose internally and and drive it externally once they really feel they've been successful internally. WestJet, uh, the uh, sort of Canadian version of Southwest Airlines, is a great example of that, where so much energy has been driven to say we're a company that cares and driving that internally first uh, is uh, really important. But again, in the book, we have uh, six reasons why companies fail a purpose, but that that is a, a big one. I see another question here. How do you balance the need for a focus on performance and profit often to meet uh, Wall Street expectations uh, with the need to uh, message higher purpose? I think it's a very good question. I think of uh, Don Goloin, the former CEO of Manulife, uh, said something really interesting to us. He said uh, that, you know, um, many leaders forget that purpose, that sorry, that profits are a reward for living your purpose. In other words, that, that it's because we solve real problems for society or for customers, uh, that's what actually creates profits. So it becomes a bit of a challenge in that, you know, as Steve Jobs constantly reminded people at Apple, if we focus on profits instead of creating products that excite, instead of serving customers in a way that engages them, then we forget that profit is a reward for, for doing the right thing, not the other way around. So I think that, 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 that the real conflict, I think, comes in when, when, when we focus on profits as an end in itself instead of the reward for doing good work that makes a difference for our clients and society. And again, ironically, uh, we know that people perform at higher levels when they see purpose. So for example, with salespeople, we know that the most successful salespeople are actually focused uh, on the difference they make for clients, uh, not on just selling more, um, you know, of whatever they're selling. So it, it, I think part of it is recognizing that the profits take care of themselves when we focus on living our purpose. And it's OK, by the way, still to talk about the numbers. You look at companies like 3M, they still talk about the numbers and here's our goals and here's the performance that we expect. Uh, it's really a question of emphasis. So in many companies, the emphasis is so strongly on profit and numbers that uh, we begin to uh, lose sight of the purpose. So I think it's really about balancing that, not eliminating any focus on on profits or or expectations in that regard. I think we had another question here. Um, here we go. Uh, uh, Eula from Houston. I have a written and well-articulated purpose, company and personal, both long, both along, and I use them chopped in pieces. How can I have instill my same values to employees? Well, you know, uh, one of the fascinating pieces of, of research that I've seen in uh, recent years uh, is the fact that that people are far more motivated by living their own values than they are by the company's values. So as important as it is to articulate your purpose as a, as a leader and the purpose of the business, it's so important to connect to the personal values of people. So here's two very practical suggestions. Number one, uh, well, actually give you an example. Um, one of the companies we're working with is Town Shoes, which is a division of uh, DSW, the large shoe uh, uh, retailer. And, uh, and they have a, a great purpose, which is happiness through self-expression. How do we really uh, help people, employees, customers, community find happiness through self-expression? Because shoes are often a, 
form of self-expression for many of us in the developed world, especially. And one of the things that that they've done is is ask team members all over the company to share stories of where they've gotten to help people find happiness through self-expression. And by allowing people to share those stories, people feel really engaged with the purpose. I think of one story that was shared by a team member who had a, 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 a very obese teenager come into the store and she had really been focused on how do I spread happiness through self-expression and was just really there for this young teenager. And the next day, the uh, mother came back to the store in tears and said to the, uh, the, the, the sales associate, I just came back to tell you what a huge difference you made for my daughter. Uh, every time we shop for shoes at the beginning of the year, she feels like she's treated like a second class citizen when we go to shop for shoes. Like what difference does it make what shoes you get? And the way you treated my daughter yesterday with such dignity and such respect, helping her find shoes that really expressed who she was, not only was she in tears of joy that night, but you just made my life so much better and hers. And I just came in to tell you. And the reason I'm telling that story is that while it was exciting for town shoes to and their leaders to say, here's our purpose, when it really came to life was when you started asking team members to share how they got to live their values through that purpose in their experience. And going back to the Royal Bank uh, experience, notice the leader wasn't the one always sharing how we made a difference since the last time we were together. It was individuals sharing in meetings. So my advice, Eula, is uh, great you've got that purpose. Continue to communicate it, but find a way to, to, to help people identify what's my purpose in my job, in my life, and begin to ask them, how are you getting to live uh, as they did at Ford, how are you getting to live a better world? How are you getting to uh, spread happiness through self-expression in, in your job? So this is such a, a key thing. So we have time for one more question before we uh, give you some closing ideas. Uh, any last question? Jeff, do you see, is there another question there? There seems to be a, a several questions around uh, the difference between purpose, vision, or mission. You know, how to uh. differentiate those. Um, you know, so, you know, so I think, you know, what, I mean, that's a good question because I think they can get mixed and they are confusing and, you know, in a lot of things, sometimes, you know, are we, you know, I think, especially as you want to start working out into the organization, you know, you don't want to get more confusing with your message and clear, right. Uh, you know, for us, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, you know, the vision, uh, you know, is, is really where you're headed, you know, what you aspire to be. Uh, and the mission is, uh, you know, is what you do. Uh, and the purpose is the why you do it. So if you start thinking about things in that way, it, it kind of makes it a little cleaner. Uh, often, yeah. I think mission and purpose probably get mixed uh, more often. And uh, and I think in our work, we don't always uh, push too hard to sort of separate those. If people have a clear mission, we just form help them form their purpose and sense of meaning around that. Yeah, and one way to think about that is look at your mission statement and ask, does it sound like a purpose? So I often think of the the, the difference between Adidas's purpose, and we we have that in the in in the in the book. I can't remember off the top of my head, but Adidas's purpose or mission statement is something like to kill the competition and make the best shoes in the world. Compared with Nike, you know, to inspire the athlete, you know, uh, in in every person, right? Uh, and so you can have a mission statement that's really about kill the competition and sell the most shoes. Uh, and again, we're not saying Adidas doesn't have purpose, but that mission statement doesn't inspire a sense of purpose. So, uh, again, a mission statement can be your purpose statement, but often in many companies, the mission statement really looks more like to uh, kill the competition and to sell more of everything we've ever sold than it does a uh, purpose statement. Well, look, we have some closing things we wanna share with you, so hang in with us. Uh, and uh, before I do, let me just uh, remind you one more time uh, that the book is coming out now in 30 days, uh, but you can pre-order the book uh, right now on uh, Amazon in Canada and the United States. 
and uh, we would love you to do that. A, because we think the book's going to make a difference for you. And because if you do it right now and, and, and just send us a screenshot of, uh, of your purchase, uh, you will immediately get access to two things you can't get any other way, which is a special electronic edition of Stepping Up. So in essence, you get another book uh, for the price of buying this one and access to a video on Leading on Purpose that I, I did that's part of our sustainment series that you can then share in your company, use freely uh, as you wish, uh, no restrictions on that, that normally people would have to buy uh, to get. So if you go to PurposeRevolutionBook.com, and I think the click is on your screen, not only can you download a free chapter, but all the links to all the sellers are right there. And let me just say personally, uh, it would really be helpful to us as well if you're a fan of our work to pre-order. It really helps to get those pre-orders in. And I, I, I tell you personally, I have never been so excited about one of my books, even though this is my eighth book, as I am about this book. So please, we know you'd love it. I hope today has been valuable to you. You will also get an archive of this webinar. If you were signed up for the webinar, you'll get that uh, uh, in a very short period of time by email. So you can share that with others. So again, we'd love you to order the book, download a free chapter, and we'd love you to get those free offers. Now, let me close with a, a final story that I think is a, a great example of how we lead in the purpose revolution. And it's a story about a man named Max. Now, I never got to meet Max, but Max was the lead custodian at the University of Montana Law School in Missoula, Montana. And I learned about Max from the dean of the law school who told me this story. Now, Max had been the lead custodian at the University of Montana Law School for almost 30 years when he retired. And they had a retirement party for him. And as a courtesy, they sent out a message to all the alumni that Max was retiring, not really expecting that many alumni would come to the uh, retirement party. The dean said to everyone's surprise, over 100 lawyers, former uh, students came and, and many, many current students came at their own expense from all over uh, the world to come to Max's retirement party. And the dean said, although everyone knew Max was a great guy and a great custodian, it really wasn't until that retirement party that they realized that Max had a purpose. Because one by one at the party, these former students started telling their stories. One uh, uh, high-powered lawyer said, you know, when I was in my first year of law school, I was, I was ready to quit. The workload was so hard and I was struggling and failing in two classes. And Max just sat me down one day and said, look, I I've been in this school for 20 years and I got to tell you, I've seen so many people in their first year struggle and, and don't quit now. At least hang in for this first year because I'm telling you, uh, I've seen so many students like you hang in there and go on to be a great success. And he said, if it wasn't for Max, I would have quit. Another lawyer said that he'd gone through a divorce in his second year of law school and was uh, ready to throw in the towel. I was so depressed. I was so discouraged. He said, and I, I happened to see Max one morning and Max sat me down and he said, sit down, son. He said, uh, he said, look, I've been married for a long time. I have no idea what it's like to go through a divorce, but I can tell you, I'd be pretty depressed if I lost my wife. He said, but I can tell you something I've discovered in my life. You never double down on a mistake. And maybe you feel like you made a mistake uh, going through a divorce, but you have a chance now not to double down and make a second mistake and give up your dream to be a lawyer. How about this? Why don't you and I meet every day and, and I'm gonna try and get you through this tough time. Please don't quit. By the end of that retirement party, the Dean realized that though Max was great at keeping the pipes running and the floors cleaned, his purpose was much deeper than that. But then the dean had his own aha. He realized, I never asked Max about his purpose. I didn't know about it. I wonder how many other people who work for me had a purpose that I never brought out or never understood. I wonder what would happen if I started asking people what their purpose was, if I started sharing my own, if I started talking about the purpose of our jobs, whether you were a faculty member or a secretary or a custodian, and not just the job function. And he said, for the last three years before I retired, I regularly made purpose a part of my conversation with employees. 
and he said it transformed my leadership. I suddenly discovered that almost everyone had a purpose, and it was my job to bring it out with them, in them. So here's the thing we'd like to leave you with. Every person in your company has a purpose. Every employee you might hire has the potential to be someone who sees a calling in their job. And it's our job as leaders to bring out the max in every person, to allow the maxes to tell their story and to create a climate where uh, the maxes of the world can truly thrive. So look, thank you so much for uh, being a part of our um, uh, work today. Again, you'll get an archive of this. On behalf of Jeff and Ainsley and our team, I wanna thank you for your time. And please, if you're interested, go to PurposeRevolutionBook.com, download a free chapter. We'd love you to get those free offers. I know you're going to love the book. And stay tuned. In about a month from now, we're going to be having a webinar on winning the purpose-focused customer, because in the book, we talk about how to win customers and employees who are purpose-focused. So if you're interested in a month from now, uh, in the middle of March, you'll be hearing about our second webinar focusing now on the customer. So thank you again. We truly appreciate your time and feel free to uh, reach out to us uh, if you want to learn more. So thanks again, and please keep on leading with purpose. Jeff, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye now. Thank you. Bye now.